Hi there, I'm Lisa Fletcher, and you're in the stream. Today, human disease prevention through ecology. We're going to discuss the link between the health of the environment and the health of people. And we're going to look at a deadly mystery illness affecting kids in Uganda called nodding syndrome. Our digital producer Malika Bilal is here looking out for your live feedback. Tweet her using the hashtag AJStream. So Malika, I was looking at the tweets. The majority of our community, they say that humans are to blame for the spread and the cause of a lot of these diseases we're talking about. You're right, Lisa. And even in Uganda, in the case of nodding syndrome, they're saying it's people, and in this case, people behind the government who aren't doing enough to stop the spread of this syndrome. So for those of you at home, if you'd like to join the conversation, if you have thoughts, questions, or comments, tweet us using the hashtag AJStream. And joining us in studio is Alonso Aguirre. He is from the Smithsonian Mason School of Conservation in Virginia. His work focuses on many fields, including wildlife ecology and the study of disease epidemics. Alonso, thank you so much for joining us. Alisa, it's a pleasure to be here. Today's show was actually suggested to us via Facebook by Sharon Opindi in Uganda. If you have an idea for a topic that you think we should be covering, just let us know. You can post your suggestions at facebook.com slash AJStream. Hi, I'm Patrice Skrell, you're the creator of beauty blog Afrogal.com. I write about natural hair and beauty for women of color, and I'm in the stream. In northern Uganda, more than 3,000 children have been affected by what is known as nodding syndrome. It's a debilitating and often deadly condition that causes mental deterioration and seizure-like activity in the brain, making those who have it seem to just nod off. And although doctors in Uganda have dealt with nodding syndrome since 2009, little's known about its cause or how to cure it. So what is being done to address the issue? Joining us via Skype from Kampala is Dr. Annette Aleno Gabirano. She's a medical doctor and advisor to the Maternal and Child Health Program with World Vision, a charity and relief organization. She's leading World Vision's response to nodding syndrome. Annette, welcome to the stream. Thank you. It's great to be here. So the cause of nodding syndrome isn't known. Uh, it's not really known if the syndrome is contagious. What's being done to address these issues right now? Uh, a lot is being done for nodding syndrome. Uh, the government of Uganda is leading the response through the Ministry of Health being the focal uh, government body. And uh, this is a resource constrained uh, setting. And I know there have been issues all over the net about the government's role and how not much is being done in, nodding, in the nodding syndrome response. Now the government has called upon all development partners like World Vision who are on board to assist the government and they formed both district level and national level task force to deal with nodding syndrome. The government has created a lot of awareness at uh, village level to the communities on case identification and also encouraging early healthcare seeking behaviors to at the community level. Uh, they've established a number of treating, treating, treatment centers for nodding syndrome where community members can refer their children who have been affected. But how are they treating and it if they don't know what causes it? Well, the treatment at the moment is really supportive. We do not know what causes it. We don't know how it's spread and we don't know how to cure it. However, we do know the effects that nodding syndrome has on children and we are actually trying to mitigate those effects. So children are nodding, which is uh, sort of like a seizure disorder. So the government is uh, encouraging a treatment with anti-seizure drugs. Uh, it also causes a lot of malnutrition, especially when people associate the nodding. It's usually triggered uh, sometimes with food. So you'll find that most many children will be starved because when they are, when they are given food, they nod. So it causes malnutrition and uh, growth retardation. So there's also nutritional supplements. At the same time, there's a psychosocial effect of a nodding syndrome, both to the affected children, their immediate families, and the community. So there's also psychosocial support being given. Mm -hmm. And that our community from Uganda and beyond is chiming in on this. Wahid on Twitter says, the problem with our approach to the subject is that we tend to focus on diagnosis and prognosis, not on how to take preventative steps. I, I'd like you to ponder that, but also before you answer, there's a video comment from a member of our community. Have a listen. Okay. I'm Francois, recording from Cyprus. I'd just like to comment on the way nodding disease has been treated because it has been known for nearly 10 years, but has remained unreported. And when it comes out, dying children are referred to as zombies. It's just not fair. Now, 
the nodding disease takes children of about 5 to 15. Is it possible that their parents have been exposed to a certain chemical agent or a virus that has then mutated? So now there are several questions there for you, but obviously the causes is one that he's addressing, and in the tweet before that, it's whether or not enough is being done to prevent this. Well, the first thing I would like to say is no one is calling those children zombies, and uh, at least I'm not aware of it. We're just calling them children who have been affected by nodding syndrome. Now, nodding syndrome was officially reported in uh, August 2009 by the district health team in the affected district. Before that, it had been noticed for five years as an abnormally high um, prevalence of epilepsy. Now, in, it had symptoms of a similar condition had also presented in Tanzania and South Sudan, but nobody was so sure of what was going on. In Uganda, it presented in a place which has been, uh, is just recovering from a 20, uh, over 20 years conflict. So there were also elements of could it, ha could it be a post-traumatic stress disorder? It's only when uh, people actually sat down and analyzed and realized it's actually only affecting children 5 to 15, and there were some specific things which were uh, ruling out epilepsy and a post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. And then it was declared publicly by the Ministry of Health, mm -hmm. and then an action plan was, was uh, drafted. Uh, Alonso, I want to bring you in here. In something like this, where it's an unknown cause, but you've got mm -hmm. thousands of children that are affected, how do you start? How do you begin to figure out this mystery? Well, that's a very interesting question, uh, Lisa, and that's uh, the role of this new government program called PREDICT in trying to get into wildlife populations, identify the pathogens that uh, these animals harbor and see if we can prevent and predict the next outbreak. In this case that we have already many children being uh, killed by this disease, we need to somehow identify the cause mm -hmm. to be able to, see, to um, do something about it. Do you have a suspicion, I mean, I, I realize nodding syndrome is not necessarily your number one area of expertise, but mm -hmm. based mm -hmm. on what you know, Alonso, is, is there a, an obvious place to start? I, I think a good idea would be for, based on symptoms uh, that may have a virological etiology, that means maybe caused by a virus. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we, knew, we have new technologies like that mass PCR, that's mm -hmm. uh, molecular techniques, that we can run some of this blood uh, from these children and see if a pathogen may be present. Well, I'm sorry to cut in, uh, Alonso. Good. Uh, the Ministry of Health has called in uh, international experts. And just uh, about two weeks ago, there was a scientific conference on nodding syndrome. And the main thing was to try to see how best we can identify what is causing it and how it is spread. Now, um, at the moment, uh, nodding syndrome is being linked to river blindness. Uh, oncosarcosis and also round roundworms and the Ministry of Health has gone ahead to to test the children who are nodding and 88 percent of them actually had uh, tested positive for river blindness and there was mass treatment for river blindness in the affected region however there's also a lot of ongoing research around the possible associated uh, conditions that are being discovered and that you mentioned the international conference is a tweet here from Nas who says prevention is better than cure. Uganda is an example of ignorance from the international community. And then another theme that seems to be running through our, our community members is this tweet that says the government failed to implement the simplest preventative measures. It did not take this issue seriously. Now, Annette, you just mentioned what some of the things that the government is doing, but there seems to be a disconnect here uh, from the people in Uganda um, to what the, the efforts that the Ugandan government is implementing. How do we deal with that disconnect? See, there's a lot of emotional uh, attachment to this. But what I can say from a World Vision point of view and uh, how we've been working with the Ministry of Health, one, everybody knows, nobody knows the cause of this syndrome. Well, that's why it's being referred to as a syndrome. Nobody knows how it is spread and nobody knows the cure. So if you say prevention is better than cure, we do not know either of them. And that is why it's being investigated. 
Do we have any more tweets on this topic? Because if not, I'm going to switch to our, our next topic <coughs> for, the, for the show today. I think our community members are gearing up for the next topic. All right, yeah, we seem to have a lot of activity in that area. So uh, on this idea of Nodding Syndrome, we're going to continue to follow this story online, so just check back with AJ Stream if you want to know more. But for right now, we're going to switch gears and discuss some other health concerns. You've heard about, of course, Ebola and West Nile and SARS and bird flu. All of these are examples of lethal animal transmitted diseases that have created public health scares around the world. But to what extent have humans been responsible for causing these and other deadly animal-borne epidemics? Today we want to discuss the intersection of ecosystem health and human health and ask whether what we're doing to animals and the environment is coming back to haunt us. Here to help us discuss this topic is, Sh is Samuel Shiner. He's the director of the Ecology and Evolution of Infectious Diseases program at the National Science Foundation. He's joining us via Skype from Maryland in the U.S. Samuel, welcome to the stream. Hi. Hey, so we understand that 60% of diseases in humans, 75% of emerging infectious, infectious diseases are caused by animals and then mutate to humans. Are, are we doing something to animals and the environment that is contributing to this or causing this? Absolutely. So what's really happened is as human population continues to grow, our interactions with uh, with wild populations have increased. And so uh, as we come in contact with wild animals that are carrying various uh, uh, pathogens, that simply increases the chances of those pathogens uh, crossing over to humans. Okay, so in terms, that's in terms of wild animals. What about the 29 billion uh, <coughs> livestock animals that are on Earth? Uh, the same sort of thing. In fact, uh, many human pathogens, old human pathogens, probably came from livestock to begin with. Uh, we've been living with those animals uh, in very close contact for millennia. Uh, and now, of course, those animals in turn uh, contact wild animals. The best example of this is uh, avian flu, influenza. So that circulates naturally among wild birds. Uh, they'll come into contact with uh, poultry, uh, chickens, ducks, and so forth. The virus can get passed uh, into those animals and then passed on to humans. Well, uh, Lisa, I think you raised a point that's striking a chord with some members of our community. Um, there's a video comment here. Alonzo, I'd like you to have a, a listen to. Mm. A new study last month found that diseases from livestock and other animals are infecting humans at a higher rate than ever causing billions of human illnesses and millions of human deaths every year. Now, historically, uh, many of humanity's greatest scourges, smallpox, measles, uh, leprosy, originated in farm animals and only jumped the species barrier when we started domesticating them about 10,000 years ago. But now, new changes in the way we're raising animals for food has given rise to a bevy of new animal-to-human diseases in recent decades. Uh, when we overcrowd thousands of animals into cramped, uh, filthy, football field-sized sheds on these industrialized farms to uh, lie you know, beak to beak or snout to snout atop their own waist, it can just be a breeding ground for a disease. We need to give these animals more breathing room. All animals, even those raised for food, deserve humane treatment, and how we raise animals can have global public health implications. We should mention that that's Dr. Michael Greger and he is the Director of Public Health and Animal Agriculture for the Humane Society of the United States. That's a pretty bold statement. How we raise animals has global and public health impacts. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Uh, the way uh, we have to produce uh, this pro animal protein to, to maintain the 9 billion people that we have on the planet is going to have implications of try to concentrate more animals into smaller spaces and turn them into meat in less time. Uh, so the use of antibiotics. How much of the world's antibiotics or the U.S. antibiotics go to animals on factory farms? I would say that pretty much uh, over 60 percent. Mm -hmm. A very few organic as we, that we call uh, foods are available. It's just a small percentage of the whole production in the U.S. Uh, as compared with Europe, maybe a little bit higher. But the issue is spills over wildlife. Many of the diseases now that we wildlife present have come from domestic animals or humans into wild populations. And now we're blaming wildlife to be reservoirs. For example, brucella. Brucellosis is a, a disease that causes ondulant fever in humans. 
and that's a cattle disease for many years. Now we try to eradicate it out of the United States, but Yellowstone National Park bison and elk are infected. So the solution of the government is let's kill all the bison and elk so we can get rid of this disease. However, uh, because of conservation issues and the icon that bison are for this country, mm -hmm. it won't happen. Well, Samuel, yes. in addition, I, I, I want to let you chime in on that, but before you do, in addition mm -hmm. to the way we're treating our animals, one thing that's being raised among our community members is climate change and the way we treat our environment. Kalali on Twitter says, partly because the environment in which the causants and vectors has been destroyed. There's another from Raj who says, rapid urbanization is what humans are responsible for, and it's only going to increase, so too are communicable diseases. And one more from Stephen on Facebook who says, as an indigenous person, of the so-called Americas, I would have to say yes. Since times Im immemorial, we have had a profound understanding that we are interconnected to the earth upon which we live. Many people have forgotten this and now we're starting to pay the price, he says. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. All of this is true. And the problem has been that historically, medicine takes a very uh, patient-centric view of all this, where individuals are treated one at a time. And what we really need to do is, is take a holistic uh, view of this problem, not look at individuals or even the human population as a whole in isolation, but consider our, ourselves as part of the entire natural world, how we're connected with it. Uh, the whole field of disease ecology uh, the goal of that uh, research arena is to try to understand how all those things intersect with each other and how, uh, how that complicated set of interactions ends up causing the kinds of diseases that we have. There's a movement called One Health with the idea that uh, human health, li livestock, wildlife, plant, uh, the entire ecosystem, we have to think of the health of everything at once if we want to be able to solve these problems. So, Sam, is there then a gap in the conversation when we're discussing uh, policy and human health that leaves out this whole e ecology connection? Uh, well, I don't know if a gap per se, just that, uh, as always, it's uh, translating scientific knowledge into policy is always a complicated process. And much of this research is relatively recent, and so there's always simply a time lag between when these things happen, and except in some instances where there's an acute emergency. For example, in the SARS outbreak a few years ago, that was a case where they actually mobilized the scientific community uh, to really try to figure out what was going on and figure out uh, under emergency conditions what should be done to contain the epidemic. Uh, but those sorts of responses tend to be relatively rare. So, Alonso, the recent outbreak of Ebola in Uganda, <coughs> how does that relate to ecology and disease? <coughs> well, we, we still don't know who the reservoirs of Ebola are. You know, it's a very nasty disease with a hemorrhagic syndrome that will kill gorillas, uh, humans. A mm -hmm. uh, recent outbreak happened this a few months ago. Interestingly, it killed um, eight uh, people from the same household, so a whole family, out of 14 or 15 cases. Mm -hmm. It's been linked to bushmeat trade. So the consumption of wild meat is an obvious uh, way to be susceptible to all these pathogens. <laughs> and is that a, a, a big issue in, say, uh, African I, countries, I the bushmeat trade? Not only the, for Africa, for the rest of the world. We know that AIDS actually emerged in Africa through the bushmeat trade by hunters uh, cutting themselves and putting contact their blood to chimps and other apes and then turning to not only apes but all other spuma viruses or retroviruses that are being identified recently. Mm -hmm. Right. A similar example is SARS which emerged in China from what's believed to be a wild civet was in the food markets in China and it jumped from the civet to humans. And we know now that bats are reservoirs of, of SARS, at least a very strong reservoir. So because of those wet markets in China, where you bring up to 300 different species and try to put them in contact uh, together, from cats to birds to reptiles to monkeys to, uh, to all that that they like to consume, 
and eventually a pathogen is going to make the jump. Uh, interesting, for example, uh, boas have a syndrome called uh, inclusion body disease, and it's been identified that the virus is similar to Ebola. So it's not, it's likely that we start seeing the mutation of these viruses going from one species or one taxa to the next. Mm -hmm. Sam, you know, a, a lot of poorer countries bear the burden of death from these zoonotic diseases, but I've been reading lately that some of the emerging zoonotic hotspots are actually in Western Europe and the U.S. Is that the case? Uh, that is certainly true. For Talk example, about that. Dengue fever, which we normally think of as a tropical disease, has now, in the last couple of years, been showing up in Florida, in the in Key West. Uh, a few cases have emerged in the last couple of years, and there's real concern that it will move from there into mainland Florida, uh, being carried from mosquitoes. And part of that is potentially connected to global warming, as temperatures increase, the ranges of many of these uh, disease-carrying insects will uh, increase, they'll move further northward, and bring with them various diseases. Well, and that, I, I would like to bring you back in here because there's a video comment from a member of our community. Have a quick listen. Hello, my name is Sadia and I'm an epidemiologist living in Ottawa, Canada. I'd like to make a comment. Although the destruction of nature is an important factor in the rise of emerging diseases, it is important to broaden the discussion and to include inequity, in particular the social determinants of health. For example, TB, which is crippling many parts of the developing world, is really a disease of poverty. Absolutely, and I would say that the linking uh, of the natural sciences to the social sciences is one of the places that's been lagging in all of this. Uh, it's certainly one of the areas that we've been trying to emphasize here at the National Science Foundation over the last couple of years as part of the program that I run uh, because of uh, uh, issues of economics, uh, social dynamics, all of those are certainly affect how humans uh, you know, human disease and livestock disease, wildlife diseases, uh, but that's been a, a bit difficult to get social scientists and natural scientists to work together. In our post show, which is coming up in just a bit, and Annette, um, sorry about uh, cutting you off there, but we'd like to get your response in the post show as well. So to do that, Samuel, Annette, Alonso, everybody sit tight. As Malika said, we're going to continue this discussion, but first we want to get to Malika, who's got some other leads that we are following. A Swedish production company has set out to test how rumors spread on the internet. It started with this Reddit posting. A friend took a photo at that fruit company. They are obviously even creating their own screws. In less than 12 hours, several sites picked up the rumor, which also spread to YouTube and Twitter. The Swedish company says its aim is to encourage people to become more critical of what they see online. Our next lead looks at a video game which tackles alcoholism. Papo and Yo is based on the game designer's own childhood and tells the story of Kiko and his friend Monster, whose addiction to frogs sends him into a violent rage. The intersection of video game and abusive reality struck a chord online. Papo and Yo made me experience something I wasn't prepared for, tweets COP0995. It made me cry. Thank you for telling your story. Lastly, a new version of Facebook for Muslims is about to launch in Indonesia. Salam World, described as a cleaner, halal version of Facebook, will allow users to filter posts about pornography or drugs. That's very impressive. I was waiting for something like this to come up. Salma, New Jersey, Brooklyn, writes on our Facebook wall. Mike Swice is doubtful. Curious to know who gets to determine what is deemed halal and to what degree censorship takes place. Well, we want to hear from you. Leave us a message at facebook.com slash AJStream. Lisa. He raises a good question. We could probably do a whole show just on that. It could be. Mm -hmm. Stay with us. The post show is next. It's streamed at aljazeera.com. Now on Thursday, Somalia, Haiti, Afghanistan, Yemen, and Iraq, they're all in the top 10 of this year's failed states index. Is it a fair assessment or an incomplete picture? My colleague Josh Rushing will be filling in for me tomorrow, so tune in for that, and then we'll see you online, and I'll see you on Monday. Take care.
Hey, welcome back. You're in the post show at stream.aljazeera.com. We're talking about ecological solutions to preventing human disease outbreaks, namely outbreaks caused by animal transmitted diseases. Uh, and we want to pick up our conversation with our guest from World Vision coming to us from Uganda. Exactly. And that before we went into the post show, we had a video comment from a member of our community asking about social determinants and whether or not that plays a role. And I, I wonder on your thoughts on that in Uganda, is that something that you see? It, it does social inequality uh, play a role in who gets certain diseases? Uh, I wouldn't say social inequality, but definitely social factors do play a large role in uh, diseases. One, it affects the way people receive information, how they interpret that information and what they do with that information, depending on their level of um, uh, their social level, that is a poverty level, and also their education level, which is interlinked. Now, for an organization like World Vision, which is community-focused and also child-focused, we found in our experience that when you build uh, people's livelihood and well-being, it also it, it influences positively all the other spheres of life. Now, coming back to diseases, uh, in this case, we've been talking about nodding syndrome and even Ebola. We've had instances where you go to the field and you find parents actually strapping uh, children with nodding syndrome to, say, a post, just so they cannot nod and fall into fires. Also, the parents can have time to go and, and, um, and farm or go to the markets and uh, participate in economic activities. Uh, without having to spend so much time caring for these children. Yeah, you know, this is back to your point, Alonso, earlier. I just want to read a tweet. Um, this is from Daki Sadat, and he says, people in Uganda eat monkeys, and this leads to the spread of Ebola. Also, prevention is hard due to ignorance. Is it hard to get this message out? It is hard, but it's changing when we're working with local communities uh, mm -hmm. through PREDICT, the project I was telling you about, uh, supported by the U.S. government, we're able to have uh, another program with it that's called RESPOND, and that's to try to train the community in better practices and how to deal with uh, consumption of wildlife. In a little study recently published, show that actually the locals of these communities prefer chicken to the wild meat. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, creating a sense of switching to other more sustainable farm practices, mm -hmm and try to teach people to protect themselves because they are continue with the practice uh, may solve some of these issues. So that's one way to help prevent these kinds of outbreaks. Sam, what are some other things that are being done to predict or prevent uh, these zoonotic outbreaks? Well, uh, it really depends on the particular system. There is no uh, specific thing, uh, but for example, uh, uh, Onchoriasis was mentioned as a um, uh, as one possible cause of nodding syndrome. It's been suggested anyway. Uh, one of the projects that's being funded uh, by our partner at the National Institutes of Health is a project to map, uh, do a big mapping survey of the incidence of onchoriasis in West Africa, in East Africa, uh, so that. Uh, we could know where it is and possibly then know where we need to treat it. And that's what we're trying to do with, um, with this project and, and, and the new book that we recently published uh, in Conservation Medicine, New Directions for Conservation Medicine, tells you about uh, many ways that we're trying to address uh, all of these diseases. In mm. fact, one of them is the mapping of the hotspots of infectious mm. diseases and try to refine it and so what we do, we go to these countries, collect samples, and try to use the latest molecular techniques to identify some of these pathogens. I've actually got a map here. You guys can take a look at, well, Sam, you can't take a look right. at it, but <laughs> Alonso, you can. If we can bring this map up, this is, it's the greatest burden of zoonoses uh, falls on one billion poor livestock keepers. So you can kind of see, is that kind of what you're talking about, laying it out? Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and then what does this tell you when you look at it? It tells us that the subtropical part of the world uh, is more prone to zoonotic uh, pathogens as compared with Europe, North America, that are more prone to antibiotic resistance or more um, diabetes and some other type of diseases. Can you separate out the, the West from the South in terms of wild animals versus livestock? Is it Not anymore. I'm no. going to tell you why. Because of wildlife uh, traffic. 
legal or illegal uh, movement of wildlife around Traffic the globe. Trafficking of wildlife? Trafficking yeah. of wildlife. Uh, for example, a, a recent study from our group showed that in five years of looking at U.S. Fish and Wildlife data, uh, over almost two billion animals were legally in introduced into the U.S. So we wow. cannot even think about it's, it's actually second to, to the drug deals that's happening around illegal the drug illegal deals. Illegal wildlife trade. Yes. Well, speaking and so of we're going to introduce new pathogens. Yeah. Excuse me. Speaking of wildlife, Uguchi on, on Twitter says humans have invaded and destroyed the natural habitat of animals, and in return they're invading our bodies and our homes as well. Uh, but there's also a tweet from James Prapa of Uganda who says, "Of course, humans are 100% responsible, but the question is, which humans, leaders or the peasants?" And I would say the leaders. And that, I'll pose that to you. Um, we're talking about the efforts that all three of our guests here today are, 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 um, are dealing with, but who has, who is the onus on? I think well, the onus... Let's have Matt answer that first, and uh, then Samuel, please do chime in. Well, um, in, a, in a country like Uganda, where we have lots of different tribes, which therefore means lots of different cultures, uh, that's a very tricky question to actually answer. You can't blame it on leaders, you can't blame it on the community per se, because many of these traditions have been passed on from their ancestors' ancestors. So it's a culture that's instilled in some communities that the leaders need to find a very good way of changing. Because some of these communities, that is what they know. That's the way of life. That is how their parents lived. That is how their parents' parents lived. And therefore, that is how they and their children will live. But the onus is on the uh, leaders to change and let them see the positive uh, side of not doing these things. And this is behavior change, which, which is a very slow process that will take some time. But definitely, I'm sure that it's being addressed by both the government and other partners. Samuel, did you want to jump in on that behavioral change? I would say, I mean, it's all of us all humans have some sort of responsibility because uh, although, I mean, some of it certainly is how society as a whole is managed, how the medical system is managed, but it's also our individual choices, our individual lifestyles. Uh, uh, even within the United States, for example, individuals want to live uh, out in uh, distant from cities in contact with wildlife because we like living in those kinds of areas but then that puts us in contact with those animals and the chance of getting uh, diseases from them. Uh, so we've done studies for example that have shown that there's potential our house cats can pick up diseases from wild bobcats and then pass them on to us uh, here in the United States. So no one person uh, is responsible, but we all have to take responsibility if we want to solve these problems. So oh. it's important, just a quick comment, mm -hmm. uh, Lisa. It's important to the, the, one of the diseases that we're dealing right here in our home is Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we know that diverse biodiversity serves as a, as a cushion to protect us from disease. It's what we call the dilution effect. As we remove species from ecosystem, we, uh, we break it down, we're gonna let only mice and rats to live. The predators are gone, and so we know that mice, white-footed mice, are highly susceptible to Lyme, so we're going to get disease one way or another. But if we protect that biodiversity, we know we can dilute that effect. And what important is to realize that these are actually very complicated uh, processes. For example, what we've recently discovered about Lyme disease is, uh, as was just mentioned, the, the main carrier uh, reservoir are these uh, small white-footed mice, which are natural in the environment. Now, they're eaten by foxes, but the foxes in turn uh, are uh, preyed upon or otherwise outcompeted by coyotes. And coyotes don't eat mice so much. So it turns out that uh, as coyotes have moved into the eastern United States uh, because we got rid of wolves. About 10 seconds, Sam. Yeah, they've, uh, the, coy the coyotes uh, kill the foxes increasing mice, more Lyme disease. All right, and that's gonna do it. Thanks to all of our guests in our community for joining us today for a terrific discussion. We'll see you online.